So I'm here in Redmond uh, in uh, the office of Klaus Jürgensen. I hope that's correct. Yes. Um, Klaus, you are PM or Principal Program Manager in the um, you, you say the team because I didn't get it right. It's a, a high available uh, high availability and storage yeah. a team, and you did some great stuff for We Next that we are now. Can we now talk about? That's mm -hmm. uh, that's really cool. But first, you introduce yourself. How long you are at Microsoft, and then we go in deep into the uh, shared nothing storage spaces. Got a, I got, oh, the other way around. I always uh, have a hard time with that. We'll okay. That hard for you. Yes. So, my name is Klaus Jorgensen. I've been with Microsoft for s close to 17 years okay. now. Spent a bunch of time in our field organization, but for the last many years, I've been working in the product groups. In the Windows Server 2012 time frame, I was specifically the PM for the SMB3 transparent failover and scale up feature work that hopefully many enjoy and use with this. By the way, platform. great stuff. We'll use it a lot at customer also. Great great features. Thank you. And for for, for next next release we're taking it a bit step further and around our storage with the uh, storage spaces. So um, if we talk a little bit about the scale out file server that is available now, you have done a lot of work there. This is a solution that has at least two servers and some JBots, right? right? Um, so there are two servers that use the same JBots. It has to be thus JBots, and this yes. is very local. You can't stretch it very far because of the uh, requirement of thus. Yes, I heard so I heard of people uh, that use thus switches. I I think this is not really I think it's not the, the right way to do that. I don't know how, how do, you, do you, you think about it. You, you don't have to say it. So but let me draw what, okay, what it is cool. that we do today, right? So today the story is uh, you have some Hyper-V. Yeah. This is one or more clusters, what have you not. And over the network, over SMB, you're accessing, accessing a file server cluster where you have like, two nodes mm -hmm. and then you have some disks in a JBot. Yeah. And as you correctly pointed out, this is more logical than actual physical drawing, but yes, as you correctly pointed out, the requirements today are that this is a SaaS infrastructure. Yeah. And below it, we have what we can call a SaaS JBOT. Mm -hmm. And you have also the SaaS disks in it. And you have to have SaaS disks. And SSDs guys. with tiering and so on. Yes. SaaS SSDs or HDDs in there. Mm -hmm. Right? So this this moved us forward a lot, a much, a lot, right? Because previous to that, you always in, when you had to build something like this, you had to use a storage area network, mm -hmm. like a fiber channel SAN or an iSCSI SAN, and people wanted less costly storage with Windows Server, specifically to store Hyper-V VM files. Yeah. Right? And so this is a great solution, by the way. It's not old school. It's a great solution, and you extend that for in the future. Yes. Yeah. So, all this is great. We present a, a highly, uh, actually, continuously available file server up to Hyper V. Mm -hmm. So, if a node fails, we fail over automatically behind the scenes and all that good stuff. But it does present a few challenges as well yeah. going forward, right? If you go and look at where is the hardware industry and where is uh, all the big server. Uh, public cloud providers like Azure is doing, they're all doing SATA disks and, and, and et cetera to drive down the cost, Yeah. right? So if you look at the, you mentioned SaaS switches. So the SaaS, as you scale this out, right, you put more nodes in here, This the wiring in these types of systems become increasingly complex. Yeah. Then you can introduce a SaaS switch to make it less, I mean, bigger and bigger and bigger. Now the other part is that SAS SSDs and HDDs are required because we have multiple computers that talk to a single device, yeah. which is the SAS protocol that can do that, which has a tendency to drive up the price of these devices. They are not, this solution is much cheaper than, or more often, or most, most of the cases, much cheaper than a classic SAN, but there, is, there are some things you can be, do cheaper or use uh, com Correct. commodity hardware, how it's so called. So we start here, we drive down the cost and we want to drive it further yeah. down, right? Okay. That's what, that's what it's about. So what we are doing, um, which will be available in the Windows Server Technical Preview 2, mm -hmm. is that we're saying, you know what, let's do this instead. 
Let's. Oh, you, you have space. You can, I can move here. Yeah. You can still do this model. There's yeah. nothing stopping you. You can upgrade and still do that model. But we also give you the option to kind of draw a few more. Yeah. To say, okay, inside the server or directly attached to the server, you have some disks. I'm going to draw just a couple. This is just as an illustration. The actual number yeah. is probably higher. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so the infrastructure before required that all the disks could be seen by all the nodes. Yeah. That a lot of our, our stack does, does that. So what we did is we did a layer which, at the bottom end of storage spaces that really puts all these disks together and presents them up mm -hmm. to all the nodes. But instead of relying on the SAS fabric to do so, we do that in software. Mm -hmm. So into Windows, we build a layer of software that we call the software storage bus. Instead of the SAS storage bus, we call it the software storage bus. Okay. And so we are using all the investments that we did in SMB3 to support multi-channels, to support RDMA, to high-speed networking, etc., to actually do all the communication between the nodes to pull this together. Right? Yeah. So think of it as I, I, I collect all these disks, I present them up to all the systems, and then when storage spaces then comes along and says, look at it, it's like, okay, I look at it, I can see eight disks. I'm going to create a pool of eight disks in this scenario, and yeah. now I can create the virtual disks on top. And can use them. And all that is with the same commands that you did in Windows Server 2012. It's really cool because you you now can use local disks. You mm -hmm. don't have to have JBODs. The cabling would be with four nodes. It would be quite complex to connect four nodes to uh, one JBOD or, or three Which or more of them. So this is great. And uh, but not, uh, now you have also network traffic between the nodes. That is doing the 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 mirroring of of the, the data. Yes. Yeah? Yes. That's correct. So uh, you so need quite a little bit of networking here, and, you, and I assume you have a great protocol for that. It's uh, yes. SMB3. That's SMB3. So as you, as you probably noticed the tendency here. So in SMB3 <laughs> was in 2012. We shipped that with SMB Direct, SMB Transparent Failover, with Multi Channel, and all that good stuff. Yeah. Then in Server 2012 R2, that was started using it for Hyper-V Live migration and other features like that. And now we're also using it for you know, the storage spaces share nothing, the internal traffic between the nodes to drive that. So you see, SMB went in, in, in this time span from being something that you used in your office to store files to become a data center protocol. Yeah. Right? And a very advanced one because yes. TCP IP, if, if you look at other vendors, and they normally use TCP IP for maybe doing that. And TCP IP is quite limited because you only can use one core for one stream. You don't normally have not this multi-channel uh, thing that you can do with SM SMB3 and no RDMA and so on. So you have yeah, a really RDMA, great... RDMA is really the kicker because RDMA drives down the latency so, 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 so low that there's almost no difference from whether we fetch the data over the network or locally. Yeah. So and the other part of it is that when Hyper-V accesses data and you use RDMA, the CPU and memory consumption up here is minimal, yeah. right? So all that CPU can go back to the VMs that is really what you want to use the CPU for, Yeah. right? So in this model, uh, you strongly recommend RDMA or is it a... We require it. It's a requirement. Yes. So to be clear, it is a requirement because you, you need low latency. Yes. Uh, uh, that, uh, I assume you have also a mirroring or three may mir three may three way Wait. mirroring. So if the hypervisor writes down one block to maybe um, server A, file server A, it has to be mirrored over the network yes. to the other ones. So so think of it this way. So in in in, in server 2012, we have we could have a disk and an enclosure as a fault domain, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that. If I, I can, as I can say, I want to do a mirror of disk, that means that the two copies of your data will go on two uh, orthogonal disks. Yeah. Then you could enable enclosure awareness so that if you had this configuration, I'm going to draw it real quick. Yeah. So you had a couple of nodes, you had one JBOD, and then you had a, a, some more JBODs, and then you connect each node to all the JBODs like this. Yeah. Then when you do enclosure awareness, so say I write copy A here. Yeah. That means that A prime, which is the copy of it, will can either go here or here, but not on another disk one. here, right? Because the whole point is that I can lose this 
and still have the access whole, to my the data. The whole J bond. The whole J bond. Because every mirrored block is in another J bond. Correct. To guarantee that. And and if you extend that thinking to this and say, each node and all its attached disks or enclosures is a fault domain. Yeah. Like this. Then the same logic applies. So Hyper-V writes some data. Yeah. That means that somewhere on one of these disks that are attached to node A, I will write my first block A. Unfortunately, I use A for both. But the A prime will then go on one of these nodes. Okay. And then if I do three copies, A prime prime will go over here. Maybe there, it could be also there. It could also be there. Yeah. And, and we can get quite deep technically. If you know, if you have a storage space, a storage space consists when you define a, let's say, a 10 gigabyte storage space. Mm -hmm. It it consists of 10 one gigabyte extents. Okay. Each extent is what I'm talking about here. So for the first one gigabyte of that storage space could be a a prime and a prime prime. Okay. But the next one gigabyte could easily be b. Oh, that was a horrible b. Yeah. B prime. And B prime prime. So you guarantee that everything is used. Uh, so we consume the whole cluster. Yeah. It's not that we only use three nodes yeah. because we have three copies. No, this whole thing is stretched out and, and spread across the entire cluster. We consume it sort of e equally. That's that's quite cool. Okay, and now one of these servers can fail, and you still have two copies of the data or one yes. copy of the data. So let's say, for example, that A fails entirely. Yeah. It goes away. It never comes back. Right? Not only do I still have two copies left of A, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm in perfect good condition, condition, but now I also have to find a, where, do I, where do I regenerate the lost data. So I have to recreate A to get yeah. back to my three copies. Okay. For B, I don't have to do anything because that was that landed was this way. Yeah. Now I really only have one place I can write A, and that is over here because I need to maintain the three copies on three different servers. Okay, so you have to have space left to write there. Yes. Yeah. So you can't consume all, or at least if you want to have for, for, for a fail of something to be to have place for a rebuild, you, you can't consume 100% of all the disks that are there. You have to have something left. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There has to be room to regenerate the data elsewhere in the system. Okay, yes. cool. So um, this I, I assume this four nodes is the, the configuration we should start with because of mm -hmm. the fail, failure domains and so on. Yes. Uh, can I extend it uh, uh, yes. to more nodes? Yes. So if I need more space? Absolutely. Our initial intent is to, to, to you start with four yeah. or higher and we can scale a single instance of the storage spaces shared nothing storage system up to 12 nodes. That's, that's our current target. That's cool. That, uh, so assume I know servers that have maybe 24 disks in there, the QU servers. Mm -hmm. uh, so this could be with 12, uh, with 12 nodes of them. That's quite yeah, a lot I mean, of disks, right? If you would say, let's just say 20 disks, yeah. that becomes 240 disks in a single system, Yeah. And in a single pool. That's quite a lot. And then we just, and then you can imagine that if you keep keep adding these nodes, then the possible targets for all these three copies becomes a lot more. So I will stretch it even wider. Mm -hmm. If I have more than four, um, I assume if I have four, we we talked about one can fail. Mm -hmm. I, I assume not an, not another one can fail because then we have 50% of our nodes yeah. lost, uh, and uh, with a three-way mirror there, there would be maybe a data left. Or yeah, but so in in, in in most of these type of systems where you don't share anything, yeah, you have to have a majority of disks or nodes left in order to say I have majority therefore I can make the decision that I stay up yeah. and the other because it's not about failing per se it's also about if you run into the scenario where I have a partitioning yeah. right if I have a network this partitioning this connection broke and you yeah. have to I have to th this system has to make a choice as to which side stays up and which side cannot yeah. stay up yeah. because if you update the data in two places you're really in trouble yeah right you're right so you have a quorum or a, a majority of, of nodes. Right. So you would add a fourth node over here, uh, sorry, a fifth node over here, and then you can tolerate two nodes disappearing completely. It could even be, you know, one node is being serviced. Yeah. Right? Uh, I have to change a RAM or something in it. And then while that is happening, I have a failure, which obviously you didn't plan for, yeah. but the system is just happily humming along. 
Okay, cool. So if you extend it to 12, um, th there cannot fail five nodes because it would be uh, too Well, much. that comes back to the three copies, right? Yeah. I, because I have to have at least one copy yeah, in the system accessible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if I, have, if I extend it to 12, also two nodes can fail. Yes, that's correct. So you should be a little bit careful how much you have, but I think it's a great solution. Two, two complete nodes is a, mu is much, is a lot. Yeah. Yes. So okay. in effect, a simple way to think about it is from 5 to 12, it's two nodes. In the 4, it's one. Right. Okay. I got that. Um, obviously, the networking, we talked about the, the, you need RDMA because you write a copy here and here and here. Yes. And then uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, does it then show back that the block is written when it's on all three disks or? Uh, when, when it's safe to commit the write, yeah. we send the acknowledgement back to Hyper-V and says we've done it. Okay. So and that is, the, the exact same rules that we have today in storage spaces are the same rules that applies here. Okay. And this is all controlled by these new definition of fault domains. And we use these new definition, we call that a storage scale unit. You can see that one when the bits, when you can play around with the bits, you can see there's a fault domain type in it, or a level, I can't remember exactly. It's called storage scale unit. Yeah. And that's by the phase default when you set this up, so. Uh, okay, um, when I saw this, I immediately, immediately thought of, oh, this, this would be also nice to stretch it between two data centers. Ah. But this is not the goal. You, no. This is one data center uh, for stretching something over or, or uh, synchronous replication. There is another solution coming that in the next. Right. Uh, but uh, th uh, to be clear, this is for one data center. This is for a single data center. We can, we can have it in a single rack. You can have it across a few racks. But remember, it's important that you have RDMA, so that, yeah. that in and of itself probably puts a little limitation. You yeah, can't put it, it 50 does, kilometers yeah. away, right? Yeah, right. Uh, so storage replica is where you want to use, if you want to put the DR on top yeah. as a disaster recovery. Then you take one instance of this, and then you storage replica down to another instance of this. Yeah. I did a video with Net that mm -hmm. would be available as, as nearly the same time we uh, our interview would yep. be available so then people can look in storage replication what this is about so another great thing here is we talked about the scale out file server there was this dependency on SAS SAS is a, a bit more expensive than SATA yep. so what kind of storage types do you support in this solution ah so with the technical preview too you can use Continue to use SAS disks okay. because you might already have some that you want to reuse for this and you want to try this out. But you can also start to use uh, SAS disks. And that's great because right. they are much cheaper than. Uh, Especially when it's uh, SSD disks, then uh, they're much cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, now we can use SATA. This will be much cheaper than uh, I think, I assume, the storage, uh, um, the scale out file server. Yeah. Oh, this is remember. This is still a scale out file server. Yeah, the scale out. We're just the, using the, a different storage on the back I end. I can't. I can't say the traditional because it's it's an actual uh, scale out file server. It it will also be available in the next version, of course. Yep. Um, and I learned another great thing. Uh, you you told us uh, if I add additional nodes, mm -hmm. um, we have our data here, and we have another node with nothing on it. Yes. So yes. Uh, in, in uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, if you add a JBoard f uh, to a solution or disks, um, uh, it's new, it, it is used for new data. Correct. Yeah. But I learned in, in your scenario, you, you've done something else. That's very cool. Yes. Let me, let me clear up the drawing a bit. A, a bit. <laughs> so it's easier to, to, to see maybe on the... Uh, so if we start again, we have, we, we, we initially bought Four, four, no, four node system and as we learned before we have some we have some uh, data uh, uh, let me do this a little bit differently so we got a a prime a prime prime b b prime b prime prime and c, would be c, c c prime and c there. prime prime like okay. this right now th of course there is uh, there's thousands of these so, yeah. so I'm not going to draw them all yeah. but now we add a fifth node yeah. On the fifth node, if you just join it to the cluster, you expand the pool to include all the hot disks that are sitting in that node. 
just doing those two operations doesn't mean that any of these extents that we've talked about before is on this node. Yeah. So right now it's just sitting there as additional capacity, but it's not being consumed. Yeah. If we had done, if we've not done this, that means that you would have to have created additional virtual disks or storage spaces, which would then start consuming the disk over here. And maybe we should add three nodes because we want to have a three-way mirror. Yeah. So this is full. Where should the other mirrors go? Exactly. Yeah. So what we can now do is we have a, 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 a feature where we can optimize the storage pool, yeah. which means that, that that we look at it and say, okay. There's two here, there's three here, there's two here, there's two here. So the best possible balancing we can do from a capacity point of view would be to move one of these over yeah. here. Okay. So it'll decide, so let's say we decide to move C prime. So C prime will be moved over here. This operation, once you kick off the command, this, these operations are completely transparent to, to the user. So if I have Hyper-V running on top of here with some I.O., That'll still run home along just fine. Yeah. Right? Of course, we will consume some disk by, because we actually have to read the data, we have to move the data somewhere else, and there'll be some I.O. in the system, but besides that, it will be not visible to Hyper-V. There will be a little bit I.O. Uh, in the system, so it gets a little bit slower, but uh, not really, it doesn't really matter, or you do this operation at night or so. Could, yes, yeah. you could schedule it to when you want so to do, run you it. You said this is a scale-out file server. All of this is scale up faster. So yes. I, uh, I, I have to ask you: Is this feature also available in the uh, scale out file server that we have today? So the model with the J boards. If you add something there, will there also be the possibility so, to? So this feature could, can also work in with, when you have a shared J bot. Yeah. So that's that's not. There's no mutual exclusion there. And this is I assume that, but I have I have to ask you because right. this is also great for for the. Traditional is wrong, of course. It's the actual scale-out file server with uh, JBots. But uh, if you add capa capacity there, you have the same problem. It, the disks yep. are not rebalanced or move the data around. People assume that, but it's a very cost. It's a cost-intensive and uh, uh, operation, uh, and it's not done by by itself. And in the next in the next version of Windows Server, you will also have the possibility to add disks and. Uh, spread yeah, the, so the load over over the disk. So say you have a configuration, just to draw it out real quick. You start here, the one I had before, right? Mm -hmm. I had three, so my data is spread across these. Then I could add a fourth, oh. assuming I have enough SAS for that. Yeah. And then I can call this uh, the, the optimized pool, and then we'll be starting moving these extents from some of these disks here to down here yeah. to try to get as close to an equal capacity utilization across all the disks yeah. as we can. What I often see, the, the three JWATs are not fully populate, populated. You, mm -hmm. They may have been only half the disk in there so that people can extend. And when, when you extend in there, you don't have to, to have new cabling or so, but you yeah. have additional capacity. Right. But it's important to still remember that all this still has to work within the confines of default domains, right? Of course. Right? Because that's the most important thing, that data survives. Yeah, that's you're right. Um, so all the good stuff is working also in this model, like uh, tiering. You, you said SSD before, but uh, I have to ask you. So we have our auto tiering uh, that yep. we have now with the scale out file server. I think it's really a great solution. Yep. I'm looking forward to test it with the technical preview too. Uh, Klaus, do you want to add something else? We talked about the scenario, the different different station, different. Diff help me please right <laughs> <laughs> between no. storage replica and uh, this thing storage replica is for dr mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, something else it's not dr it's data spread like this is for, this is for hyper v it's hyper v primary storage yeah right so there, it is not intended to run your office storage or, yeah. or stuff like that right uh, I learned a lot that people think the scale-out file server is great. We put files on it uh, as, how you call it, information worker. Yep. It's not the right choice. The scale-out file server is for Hyper-V. Well, that was, that was a very deliberate decision when we originally built the scale-out file server because we wanted to make sure that we focused in. The, 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 the most important thing to address was to give a good solution for Hyper-V storage. Mm -hmm. Right? But there is a, a, a number of technologies that are incompatible with the scaling out of SMB 
like DFS replication, yeah. like some of the file classification infrastructure we have, etc. So all of these, uh, well actually none of these features are compatible and works with the Scalar file server. So what can happen is that while you say that, well, the Scalar file server, I can store a Word document. Sure, you can save a Word document. There's nothing stopping you. The problem is that the moment you want to use DFSR or you want to use file classification or you want to um, uh, do other stuff like quota, then you say, oh, but wait a minute, all these features are incompatible with the Scalar file yeah. server. Now I have to migrate all my data. Yeah. So I'd rather tell you up front, don't even start down down the route. Yeah, right. It's important. It's and Hyper-V is a great workload for that. Yeah. So um, it's a great feature. I'm really looking forward to technical preview too. It will be available. Yeah. Uh, I assume there will be some documentation how you uh, how you set it up. Uh, yes. Uh, so the documentation on how to evaluate this feature is uh, is will be available on TechNet. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't have the link. I can't share the link right now. It's but not there yet. But it's it not there be. yet. But it will be. Yeah, cool. Uh, Klaus, thank you very much for the education on that. I, I liked it a lot and uh, I'm looking forward to the technical preview and to the Ignite conference. I yeah. think you will, you will uh, show more about this at the Ignite conference. That's the intent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.